Hi, and welcome to our first lecture for Bio 102. And this lecture will be covering chapter nine, which is called the links in life chain, genetics, and cell division. Section 9.1 goes over an introduction to genetics. So let's first go over what genetics is. And genetics is the study of genes, which is how traits are stored in an organism. So genetics looks at um, the study of those genes and then how those traits get passed from one generation to the next. Now, every trait in your body is determined by your DNA, and DNA contains the information for the production of proteins, which carry out a wide variety of tasks in living things. So these proteins help your body do everything it needs to do, as well as um, tell your body how to grow and form, and that determines what you look like, what features you have, whether you're a boy or a girl, you have black hair or blonde hair, and the DNA is encoded in chemical substances called bases. So if you look at this structure here, this, this structure is DNA. And these little pieces on the DNA are called bases. And it's, a, it's just a piece of this chain here. And there are four different kinds of bases that make up the code of DNA. And those bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we abbreviate that adenine is A, thymine is T, guanine is G, and cytosine is C. Now your body will go along and start reading your DNA. And as it reads the DNA, it gets to a certain spot in the DNA where it has finished reading a segment of DNA. And that segment has told your body to make a protein. And so this certain code tells your body to make this specific protein. Now the segment of DNA that codes for one protein is called a gene. So if you hear the term gene, it's just a certain amount of DNA that's coding for a specific protein. Now genes can be all different lengths. In this picture here, it's showing, showing a length of four different bases, um, but genes can be varying lengths. The important thing about a gene is that it's coding for one specific protein. So your body will read the DNA, your cell will read the DNA, and get through that gene, code for that protein, and then continue reading that DNA. And the next segment of DNA, the next gene, will code for a different protein, and so on as your body reads through all of the different genes in your DNA. So a gene, as I mentioned, is a segment of DNA, and that segment of DNA codes for a protein, and that protein will give you the different traits in your body. So for example, if you think about your eye color, many different genes control your eye color, and the genes tell your eyes how much melanin to produce and many other things in order to make your exact eye color and pattern. So melanin, we usually think of it in our skin as how light or dark your skin is, but you also have melanin in your eyes. And that melanin, the amount of melanin can determine whether your eyes are light blue or very, very dark brown. Now, if you take a look at the example to the right, it shows some of the DNA bases that work together just to produce eye color. So if you look here at your genes, if you were to have the DNA bases cytosine and cytosine at this specific location here in your DNA code, that those two C's would code for blocking some melanin. And when you have those two C's at that location, you will often end up with light colored eyes. If you have two guanines or two G's at this different location, that will block some more melanin, me, sorry, melanin, and you also give light colored eyes. If you have, um, let's say, bases adenine and adenine at this location, it will give you a weak amber gradient, so sort of an amber color to your eyes. Different gene codes will give you sort of that starburst pattern in your eye. If you have sort of that color that looks like a starburst coming out of your eye, this different gene code um, at this location will give you flex in your eye. And so there's all these different genes and they all interact together and that's just to produce eye color. So those are certain segments of bases that are coding for um, 
different proteins that then tell your body to do these things. So the protein might cause the effect of, um, or have the effect of blocking melanin. The protein might have the effect of making amber in your amber color in your eye. It might have the effect of making a gray ring around the edge. The important thing to take away is that a gene is a segment of DNA. That DNA codes for a protein, and then that protein does something in your body, such as um, blocking melanin or um, proteins do all kinds of different things, but just for your eye example, that's what that's one example that proteins do. Okay, now we know that a segment of DNA is called a gene and that your body reads that DNA within that gene and creates a protein. But let's talk a little bit about how that protein gets made, how that process actually happens, and that's called protein synthesis, or just making a protein. Now, protein synthesis begins with the information in the sequence of DNA bases. So you're looking at a group of DNA, so some segments in that DNA code. Remember, again, we have the letters C, A, T, and G are our DNA bases, and those DNA bases get copied onto a piece of messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA just starts building copy of that DNA code. So the copy gets made and your DNA always stays inside the nucleus or the center of your cell. So that DNA stays there, but the copy of the DNA, which is called mRNA, gets made and that copy then will leave your cell. So this reddish purplish area here is your cell. That copy called messenger RNA leaves the cell and then goes into goes to a structure in the cell cytoplasm called a ribosome. So the um, in the ribosome, then the mRNA sequence is brought together with building blocks of protein called amino acids. So there are a whole bunch of amino acids floating around, and the as the mRNA code gets read those amino acids start getting placed together in the order specified by this mRNA code. And so the result is a chain of amino acids. So it starts taking these amino acids, putting them in the correct order, and that builds a specific protein. So this can get complicated even when you've heard it a lot of times. Main takeaway, um, if you can remember from how proteins get made is that a copy of the DNA is made. DNA never leaves the center of the nucleus. A copy gets made, a copy then leaves the cell, and that copy is used to tell um, this, to, to essentially take, put together a chain of amino acids and build a specific protein. And that sp specific protein, as I mentioned, produces some specific response in your body. Almost every cell in your body will contain a complete copy of your full DNA code. And your full DNA code is known as your genome. And um, the genome is essentially it's a complete set of all the genes or genetic material present in an organism, full copy of an organism's DNA. Now a human genome, or your complete DNA code, contains about 3 billion base pairs of DNA. And so that's 3 billion of these bases here. Now if you notice DNA has two different strands that are um, kind of wrapped around each other. And on one strand there are bases, and on the opposite strand there are there is a different set of bases. Now, these bases, um, the one on one side and one on the other side are called a base pair because they pair up together. Now, DNA has practical uses that we use in our society, and it's used in everything from forensics to solve crimes to finding out where different groups of people migrated from. So if you've ever wondered when you hear of these things like AncestryDNA.com and these other sites that can take your DNA and um, tell you somewhat where you come from, 
The way that they're doing this is by looking at um, certain sequences of DNA. And for example, scientists have found recently that DNA shows that Native Americans all descended from one ancestral population called ancient Beringi Beringians in central Alaska. And so if you look at all of the Native Americans in um, North and South America, they all, um, through their DNA, they found that they all um, came from this one group in this area here in central Alaska. But um, let's look at how exactly they can look at your DNA to find that out. We've talked about that humans have a set of DNA that is about 3 billion of these bases long. Now, every single human has a unique set of DNA, except for, of course, identical twins who share the exact same set of DNA. But humans who are more closely related have more similar DNA than humans who are not as closely related. So you will have very, you will have, um, for example, half your DNA comes from your mom and half your DNA comes from your dad. And so your DNA is very similar to both your mom and your dad. It's also very similar to any of your brothers and sisters, to your aunts and uncles. And then the further you go back um, through your relatives, the further back in time you go, say to your great, great, great grandparents, their DNA is still somewhat similar to you, but not as similar as your mom and dad. Now, what they can do through studying, scientists can do through studying DNA, is look at the DNA code of people in certain areas. And what they are looking for is patterns in that DNA code that occur in one region, but don't occur in other regions of the world. So for example, let's say that a group of people um, living in a certain area all have the code CCTT and no one else in the world has that code CCTT at this specific point. So they have that the specific gene that we don't find anywhere else in the world. Now as those people migrate and have children and pass on that um, sequence of genes, that CCTT, any of their children who move will also have that genetic that specific pattern in their DNA. And so anyone that you find in the world that has that pattern in the DNA, we know that they come from that region. And so when you um, say a site like the Ancestry DNA um, type site, takes a look at your DNA and tells you that you are um, part Russian or part Irish, they're looking for these segments that um, we believe come from these certain regions. Now it's not 100% and new DNA is constantly being studied and um, it's kind of a newer science, but um, it gives you a general idea of probably where those people came from. Now some of the newer evidence that they've found in terms of um, determining where the Native Americans came from I came from a site in Beringia called um, the Upward Sun River site, and they found two buried infants at a um, residential campsite called Upward Sun River in what is currently in central Alaska. And they were able to identify the whole genome, so the entire three billion bases of one of the infants, a six week old, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, but they called her the Sunrise Child Girl. And it revealed that she was part of a distinct and previously unknown group of um, ancestors that descended from the same founding population as all other Native Americans. So when they looked at her specific code, let's say she had this pattern in her code, as well as all other Native Americans um, that we that we know of with their DNA. So it's a little bit complicated, all the specifics of exactly how they know that. Um, we could certainly look more into that, but the key is that they're, they are able to use that DNA and look for patterns in that DNA and tell where people moved from and when they moved from there. And that's kind of neat information that they are able to get out of your DNA. We'll cover a lot more on DNA later, so don't feel like you have to understand 
um, everything about DNA, but hopefully at this point you understand that DNA is a series of these what we call bases that code for certain traits. And we're going to go into the rest of the chapter and looking at how cells divide and part of cell division that's important is how DNA gets copied and it also divides. So in section 9.2, we will cover an introduction to cell division. Cell division is an extremely important process in your body. And let's look at why cells need to divide. Why is this so important? So one reason cells need to, to divide is that your cells are constantly dying and they need to be replaced. And so when a cell divides, it goes from being one cell to being two cells. And so from this one cell, two cells are made, and that means that another cell that died has been replaced. Cells can also um, only grow so large before they become dysfunctional. So cells, um, instead of just growing bigger and bigger, they need to divide in order for the body to grow. So your cells just, as you go from being a child or an infant to an adult, your cells can't just become bigger. They need to divide and make more cells so that your body can grow. And there are also times in which an organism needs quantities of new cells above replacement levels. So there's some reason that the, you need a large, larger amount of cells. And so cells divide in those circumstances as well. Before a cell can divide, though, their, their genome or full DNA code must first be copied. So sitting inside your cell is this nucleus here with one copy of DNA in it. Now, before the cell can can split into two, it ha the DNA gets copied. So then you have two copies of DNA. Those copies get nicely split apart so that one copy of DNA goes to each side of that cell. And then that cell begins to split and will split into two new cells. And they call these the daughter cells. Not sure why they went with daughter and not son, but um, those you have your parent cell, and then you have your daughter cells. So the first step in a cell dividing is again when the DNA gets duplicated. And this step where you go from one copy of DNA inside your cell to having two copies of DNA inside your cell is called replication. The second step in a cell dividing is mitosis. And this is where the two pieces of DNA are moved to opposite sides of the parent cell. And then the third and final stage of cell division is called cytokinesis. And this is where the two parent cells physically split apart and become two, or sorry, the one parent cell splits apart and becomes two daughter cells. So again, the three stages of cell division are replication, mitosis, and cytokinesis. In order for the DNA to get copied, the DNA first gets split apart, sort of like unzipping a zipper, by an enzyme that comes along and slowly moves up the DNA, slowly unzipping or pulling those two DNA strands apart. Once those two DNA strands start being pulled apart, new bases get added on to the each existing strand to match up um, with the bases that are already on that strand. And so essentially on this strand where you used to have one set of bases, a second set of bases is built across from it. And the same thing happens on the other strand. And so in the end, what you end up with is two different strands, one with the original copy of each with the original copy of the DNA and say the brown here, and then each with a new copy um, or single strand of the DNA on each side. So each new piece of DNA um, has is half of the original DNA and then half of um, the new DNA that was added on. Next in section 9.3, we'll look at DNA and chromosomes. So DNA, rather than being in one long continuous strand within your cell, is actually packaged into these little units called chromosomes. Those are, these are all different chromosomes here. Most of them are sort of an X shape, and each of these is a bundle of DNA. And so all of the different chromosomes in your cell are what make up your full genetic code. Now in humans, most humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 
So 22 of sort of the typical X-shaped chromosomes, and then an additional pair of chromosomes called your X and Y chromosome. You may have heard of those. Those are the chromosomes that determine um, your sex, so whether you are male or female, depending on what combination of X and Y chromosomes you have. Now, chromosomes are composed of DNA and the proteins that are associated with that DNA. So they get sort of coiled up into this substance called chromatin. So it's a chromatin is just a bundle of DNA and proteins. And that chromatin or that DNA protein gets all folded up into the chromosome shape. Chromosomes um, exist in an unduplicated state until such time as DNA replicates prior to cell division. So there's one copy of each chromosome in your cell um, until your DNA is ready to replicate and then you will have an additional copy of all the chromosomes in your cell at that point. So um, at the DNA level, when we look at DNA replication, if you remember the DNA first unzips and then becomes two separate copies of DNA. So if you were to look at that at the chromosome level, what that would essentially be like is having um, one half of, of the uh, chromosome like this and um, it becoming two pieces of the chromosome. So one copy of the DNA and then here showing two copies of the DNA. So before your DNA duplicates, your chromosome sort of has one side of this X shape here. The DNA then gets replicated and then you have two sides to the chromosome which make up that um, that X shape to your chromosome. Now the two sides of the chromosome after they are after it gets replicated are called sister chromatids. So this one here and this one here are called sister chromatids. Chromosomes in human beings and in many other species come in matched pairs. So if you were to look at your all of the chromosomes in your body, you have two copies of chromosome one, two copies of chromosome two, two copies of chromosome three. And the reason for this is you get one copy of each chromosome from your mom and one copy of each chromosome for, from your dad. So they call these matching chromosomes, the one from your mom and the one from your dad, matched pairs. Now the two chromosomes that are essentially the same chromosome, but one from mom and one from dad, um, have closely matched sets of genes. So for example, if this chromosome has a gene on it coding for a certain aspect of your eye color, then in that same location on the chromosome from your dad, it will also have a gene coding for eye color, usually. Now the genes will often be in the same location on the same chromosomes, but the actual gene may not be identical. So for example, you might have a gene on the chromosome from mom coding for blonde hair and the chromosome from dad coding for um, brown hair. And so, so they're both coding for hair color, but they can code for different um, traits, different, different, um, different hair colors. As I mentioned earlier, we have a total of 23 pairs of chromosomes, and each pair of chromosomes has two chromosomes in it. So that's a total of 46 chromosomes in humans. There are 22 matched pairs of chromosomes. So if you look at, there are 22 of these pairs. So one pair here, one pair here, and all the way up to 22 different pairs of matched chromosomes. That means there's one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad that are the same chromosome just from either parent and then so we have 22 of those pairs and then we have one pair of non-matched chromosomes which are your x and your y chromosome and those are what you get from one from your mom and one from your dad that determine your sex so whether you're going to be male or female so if you have two x chromosomes that means you got an x chromosome from mom and an x chromosome from dad then you are going to be a female and if you have an x chromosome from mom and a y chromosome from dad that means you will be a male so moms will always give their offspring an x chromosome dads have an x and a y and so they can either give an X chromosome 
um, to the offspring, in which case the offspring would be a female, or they can give a Y chromosome to the offspring, in which case the offspring would be a male. Now this full group, if you look at an organism, all of their, a picture of all their different chromosomes, they call this a karyotype. So if you hear that term, it's just looking at that visual picture of what all the chromosomes of a certain individual or organism look like. So cell division is just part of what a cell does, but all of what a cell does throughout its life cycle is called the cell cycle. And the cell cycle has two main phases, which are interphase and the mitotic phase. So interphase is where the cell carries out its work, where it grows, where it's duplicated, um, where the DNA duplicates, and um, where the chromosomes prepare to divide. So it's everything except for the cell actually um, splitting into two. So in the first phase of the cell cycle, the cell is just growing, so it's getting bigger. In the next part of that, um, this is all interphase here. The next part of interphase, the DNA will replicate. Then further on in interphase, the cell will grow some more. And then after interphase, you enter the mitotic phase, which is this phase right here. And that is where in mitosis, remember that's where the DNA moves to opposite sides of the cell. And then there's cytokinesis where the cell splits in two. So again, we have interphase, which is where a cell spends most of its time, where it grows, where the DNA replicates, where it goes on about all the things that the cell needs to do. And then we have, um, after interphase, we have the mitotic phase, where the DNA splits to opposite sides of the cell and the cell splits into two. Now in section 9.4, we'll talk more in more detail about what exactly happens in mitosis and in cytokinesis. There are four stages of mitosis, and these are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and we will go over each of these phases next. First, we'll do a quick overview of mitosis, and this is where, again, in mitosis is where the DNA moves to opposite sides of the cell, and the cell um, prepares to split into two. So we'll do this brief overview and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slide. So the first phase that we have in our cell cycle is interphase where the cell's doing its normal um, things that it does on an everyday basis. At some point in that cycle, the DNA duplicates and so you will have two copies of each chromosome. And these two copies of each chromosome will line up at the center of the cell. So um, here's our center of the cell. Say this is the center here. So the chromosomes will all line up along the center. And um, so one half of the chromosome, if you remember, these are the sister chromatids. This, so one half of the sister chromatid is, if you drew a line down the center of the cell, one sister chromatid's on one half and one sister chromatid is on the other half. And this would be the same. So all of your um, chromosomes in your cell will line up along the center here. And the next phase, and that's metaphase, where everything lines up at the center. Anaphase is where the sister chromatids get pulled apart and move towards opposite sides of the cell. And in telophase, the um, cell begins to pinch in the middle and in cytokinesis, the cell will completely split into two identical new cells that are the exact same as the parent cell that you started out with. Okay, so let's look at um, mitosis in a little bit more detail here. So in interphase, uh, which we haven't talked about yet, your DNA is actually just like um, a big blob of spaghetti. It is not organized. It is not in these nice, neat chromosome shapes. It's just laying around all wound up and um, kind of all over the place inside the nucleus. So that's at the end of interphase. Your DNA, remember in interphase, it doubles. So you do have two copies of the DNA at this point. It's just not organized. So next we move on to starting mitosis where the cell starts to, the chromosomes start to organize and split apart. And that first step is phase in mitosis is called prophase. And in prophase, the, 
the DNA coils up into these chromosome shapes. So um, your chromosomes take shape. And then structures called centrosomes, which are these gold things here, start to move towards the end of the cell. So they start to sort of pull apart. One moves towards one end of the cell. One moves towards the other end of the cell. And sort of like spiders making a spider web, they sprout these things called microtubules, which are going to help um, pull apart the chromosomes later. So these, again, are called centrosomes, these gold things, centrosomes, and they begin in prophase to move towards opposite ends of the cell. Next, we have metaphase. And in metaphase, the chromosomes become attached to these microtubules, to these fibers, and um, they, so the chromatids and the microtubules help line up these chromosomes these chromosomes at the, get lined up at the center of the cell. During anaphase, the sister chromatids are moved to opposite sides of the cell. So your sister chromatids, which are one half of that chromosome, start getting pulled by the microtubules to one, one half gets pulled to one side of the cell and the other half gets pulled to the other side of the cell. And that's an anaphase. And finally, in telophase and cytokinesis, this is when the cell is preparing to exit from mitosis, to move on from mitosis, and the nuclear envelope, or sort of this um, outside of the nucleus, begins to pinch in, and they call this, when something pinches in like this, they call that cleavage. So that's a cleavage furrow begins to form, and it's where the cell membrane is, or sorry, the nuclear membrane is pinching in, around these two new um, separated groups of chromosomes. Finally, in the completion of cytokinesis, one cell officially becomes two. Um, the membrane completely pinches, the nuclear membrane completely pinches in, and you have your, um, your full, your cell membrane also completely pinches in, and you have two new cells that are exact copies of the original cell that you started out with. And as you notice here, the DNA has gone back to being unorganized and loose. And the cells then, these two new cells then move again into interphase. Here's a picture here of a cell, an animal cell actually going through cytokinesis. So actually beginning to be pinched in the middle and start to split apart. And that works through a ring of protein filaments that tightens at the middle of a dividing cell. So if you think of like taking a string and tying it around the middle of a ball or a balloon and sort of pinching it in, in the middle, it's essentially what these protein filaments are doing. So they're working in the middle here and just starting to pull down through the middle of the cell and pinch it in. And eventually they will pinch all the way through the cell and result in the two, the side will become one cell and the side will become another cell. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is section 9.5 and look at how cell division occurs in bacteria and plants, which is a little different than how it occurs in the animal cells that we just looked at. So here's a picture of a plant cell undergoing cell division, and here's a picture of a bacterial cell undergoing cell division. If you remember from Bio 101, plant cells have a cell wall around them, so sort of a hard wall, whereas animal cells just have a membrane that can easily bend and pinch in. Well, the plant cell wall that's hard prevents it from pinching in the middle like an animal cell. So instead what happens is the plants um, grow new cell walls in the plasma membrane near the metaphase plate, which is just the center of the cell. So it starts to form these little vesicles here that eventually will grow and fuse together to form a new um, cell plate or cell wall in the center of the plant cell. And so as the plant cell is um, separating its um, chromosomes from on either end of the cell, after it gets them separated, it will it will um, form the cell wall down the middle of the plant cell and it will eventually grow completely all the way across and form two distinct new daughter cells. In bacteria, they use a process called binary fission and the way that they do this is they 
bacteria have a single circular chromosome, so a singular a single circular piece of DNA, and they double their DNA first. So the first phase is that they make two copies of their only chromosome that they have, or sorry, they make a copy of the only chromosome that they have. And then the plasma membrane and cell wall will start to sort of grow inward and form what's called a septum. So this sort of divide in the middle of the two cells and then the septum will eventually go all the way across and the bacteria cells will split apart into two new daughter cells. That's the end of our chapter 9 lecture so good luck this week getting started with all of your courses and please let me know if you have any questions as you get started with this course.